Let's elucidate quantum teleportation. In this video, we're going to explore visualizations of superdense coding and quantum teleportation. In these visualizations, time flows from top to bottom. Black solid lines represent qubits, and black double lines represent classical bits. Check out the description to see where you can download the diagrams shown in this video. Before we go into the details of these visualizations, we're going to need to introduce some useful notation for the Bell basis states. In this purple box, you can see the four Bell basis states. And below the purple box, you can see a quantum circuit diagram which shows us how to go from the computational basis to the Bell basis. In this visualization, there are two black solid lines, and they represent the two qubits. We also have a Hadamard gate, represented by this H, and we have the controlled NOT gate. The black solid circle is placed on the control qubit, and the target symbol is placed on the target qubit. By convention, the qubit on the left is called qubit 1, and the qubit on the right is called qubit zero. Let's have a look at three stages in this procedure. Time flows from top to bottom. So the first stage is initialization. We are initializing qubit one in the single qubit computational basis state labeled by B1. And we are initializing qubit zero in the single qubit computational basis state labeled by B0. Both B1 and B0 are bits. They can take on values of 0 or 1. If we take the tensor product of these single qubit states, we will get the two qubit computational basis state. So this purple line is slicing through the quantum circuit diagram, and it is giving us a snapshot at this stage in the procedure. So this is just after initialization. We have this two qubit computational basis state. So this allows us to have a general notation when we use B1 and B0. This includes all four options. So the four options are 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, and 1, 1. So that is what we have over here. It's a very condensed notation. The next stage in this procedure is to apply the Hadamard gate to qubit 1. And we can take a slice through this quantum circuit diagram and see what happens to the quantum state. So this is one way of denoting the action of the Hadamard gate on qubit one. So we have H with a subscript one. That tells us that it's not acting on qubit zero. It's not acting over here. It's acting specifically on qubit one. And when there is nothing over here, that's the same as the identity. So the identity is acting on qubit zero. Let's see what the Hadamard gate does to qubit 1. It creates a superposition of the single qubit computational basis states, 0 and 1. And there is a relative phase factor of minus 1 to the power of B1. If B1 is equal to 0, we have a plus sign. And if B1 is equal to 1, we have a minus sign. That is a relative phase factor in this superposition. Because we have a tensor product, of these single qubit states, we can also factor this back in and write this as a condensed notation. So we have a superposition of 0, b0, and 1, b0, with a relative phase factor. And that relative phase factor depends on the value of b1. So it depends what we initialize this qubit 1 as. And notice that we have a normalization coefficient out the front. This is 2 to the power of minus 1 half. We can also write this as 1 over the square root of 2. So this is what happens after the Hadamard gate is applied to qubit 1. Now let's see what happens when we apply the controlled NOT gate. And you can see the notation for this controlled NOT gate. We have C sub 1, X sub 0. So this is telling us that qubit 1 is acting as the control and qubit 0 is acting as the target. And we're applying this after we've applied the Hadamard to the computational basis state for a two qubit system. So what does this do? Well, you can see this is a very similar format to what we have over here. The only difference is there is a bar above this B0. That bar denotes a bit flip. 
So if B0 is equal to 0, we're going to flip it, we're going to turn it into 1. And if B0 is equal to 1, we're going to turn it into 0. Why is that happening only in this term, but not in this term? Well, this is a controlled NOT gate. It's a controlled bit flip. So this 0 over here, this is the control qubit. And the 0 is telling us that this is turned off. So nothing happens to this basis state. But over here we have a 1, so that means there is a flip. The flip gets turned on. That is what we mean by controlled NOT. So that is a general way of writing all of the Bell basis states. After we apply the Hadamard gate to qubit 1, and then the controlled NOT gate, where the control qubit is qubit 1 and the target qubit is qubit 0, we're going to get this general format for the Bell basis states. And if we look up here in this purple box, we can see each of the specific cases. We have four cases over here. So on the left-hand side over here, we have a concise notation that is just a label for these four states. And the label involves two bits. Those are actually the values of B1 and B0. And they tell us what the initial state is in this procedure. So what are the values of these bits that allow us to describe the computational basis state at the beginning when we initialize the two qubits. And then once we apply the Hadamard gate and the control NOT gate, we get these superpositions. But note that these superpositions can also be expressed in this format over here. So we can, we can write them in this concise form. We have beta with a subscript B1, B0, but we can also write them as beta 0, 0, that's this Bell basis state, with a bit flip and a phase flip acting on that state. So let's begin with this state, beta 0, 0. If we apply a bit flip, so that's the same as applying Pauli x to qubit 1, then we're going to get this state over here. So if we just focus on qubit 1, that's the one on the left, this 0 gets flipped to a 1, and this 1 gets flipped to a 0. That is the effect of this x1. So the subscript is telling us that this is acting on qubit 1. And the superscript is telling us the power. So here we have x to the power of 1, so we are applying one bit flip to qubit 1. And we have z to the power of 0, that means we're not applying a phase flip. So Pauli, the Pauli Z gate is the same as a phase flip. But now let's consider the opposite case. Over here, we're not applying a bit flip, but we are applying a phase flip. The phase flip is going to add a minus sign in front of the term with a 1. So here we have a term with a 1 for qubit 1, and this is going to introduce a minus sign. And that's what we have over here. And finally, what happens when we apply a bit flip and a phase flip? So if we just apply the bit flip, we have this state. And then if we apply another phase flip to that, then this one over here is going to get an extra minus sign. And we've swapped around these terms over here. So that gives us this term over here. So this zero one term is unchanged by the phase flip. The phase flip only affects this one zero term. That's the action of the Pauli Z gate on the first qubit. So this is a condensed way to write all four of these terms. So we can just put B1 and B0 as the powers, and then we will specify all four of these Bell basis states. So we have several different ways of thinking of these Bell basis states. We can think of them in terms of this labeling system over here, where we just label them in terms of the, the two bits over here. We can also think of them as a computational basis state for a two qubit system being transformed into a Bell basis state. That's what this notation hints at. And we can also think of them as a superposition of computational basis states. That's what this explicit form shows us. And this is a representation in the computational basis for the two qubit system. And finally, we can think of them as bit flips and phase flips acting on qubit one after we've initialized the state beta zero zero. So that's this first uh, of the four Bell basis states. Now that we've introduced this general notation, we're going to be using it in the subroutines of both super dense coding and quantum teleportation. Here we have a side by side visualization of super dense coding and quantum teleportation. Both of these protocols can be subdivided into 
three subroutines. These subroutines are called preparation, sending, and receiving. The preparation subroutine is performed in the preparer's lab, and it is shown in these green boxes. Observe that the preparation subroutine is identical for both protocols. That means quantum teleportation and superdense coding both begin with the same preparation procedure. After preparation, we can see these black diagonal solid lines. They represent a single qubit being sent through a quantum channel. So once we prepare these qubits in a bell state using this preparation procedure, we can distribute them to the sender's lab and the receiver's lab. In the sender's lab, we're going to perform the sending subroutine. And that's shown in these blue boxes. And in the receiver's lab, we're going to perform the receiving subroutine. And that is shown in these red boxes. So the initial inputs to this sender lab, they actually have to come from this preparer's lab. So we have to have a quantum channel between these labs to transport this qubit. So this is a single qubit quantum channel. You can see it occurring over here in superdense coding and also in quantum teleportation. And we are also distributing the other one of these entangled qubits over to the receiver's lab. So that is this quantum channel. So these diagonal lines are quantum channels. And in quantum teleportation, you can also see this channel over here, but this is not a quantum channel. These are not solid black lines. Instead, they are double lines. And these double lines represent classical bits. And we have two classical bits being sent through this classical channel. So in quantum teleportation, we have these two single qubit quantum channels that are being used to distribute entangled qubits to the sender's lab and the receiver's lab. And then we also have a classical channel, which is being used to transfer these bits from the sender's lab to the receiver's lab. But in superdense coding, we don't have any classical channels. We just have quantum channels over here. So there is a quantum channel between the sender's lab and the receiver's lab. So in the preparation procedure, these protocols are identical. But this is the point when we get to sending, that is when they start to differ. Observe that the superdense coding sending procedure is the same as the quantum teleportation receiving procedure. Similarly, observe that the quantum teleportation sending procedure is the same as the superdense coding receiving procedure. We have the same gates occurring in these boxes over here, and we have the same gates occurring in these boxes over here. The only differences are the inputs and the outputs, but the stuff inside the box is the same, so we're still doing the same steps. We're just doing those steps to different inputs. So let's have a look at what is going on in super dense coding. We have this sending procedure. And inside this sending procedure, we have classically controlled X and Z gates. So over here, we have a quantum gate. So this, this gate over here, as we saw previously, is the controlled not gate. So this full solid black circle is being placed on the control qubit, and this target symbol is being placed on the target qubit. And you can see a solid black line that is linking these two qubits. So that is a controlled NOT gate. But over here we have a classically controlled NOT gate, and that is depicted with this double line. So these are classical bits in this input, and they're being used to perform these classically controlled gates. And notice that over here, we don't have a target symbol. That's because this is a classically controlled Z gate, or we could also call it a classically controlled phase flip. So we have a bit flip and a phase flip. And this bit flip and phase flip, they are being controlled classically with these bits. So the goal of super dense coding is to take these two bits from the sender's lab and transport them over to the receiver's lab. But we're doing that in a very special way. We're using a quantum channel, which only has a single qubit. 
So we're sending two classical bits through a single qubit channel. That is super dense coding. But what is going on in quantum teleportation? In quantum teleportation, we don't just have these two qubits. We have an additional qubit. And we want to teleport the state of this qubit. And that is shown as psi over here. So Q2 is the label for this qubit. And the state that this qubit Q2 is being initialized in is labeled by psi. And we want to take that state and transport it over to the receiver's lab. So what do we do? Well, we implement this procedure, and then we send two classical bits through a classical channel, and that's enough information to reconstruct this quantum state. Inside this sending procedure, you can see the controlled NOT gate, the Hadamard gate, and these measurement gates. So the order is actually swapped. Over here, we have the Hadamard gate first, and then the controlled NOT gate. That's when we're preparing Bell states. We're going from the computational basis to the Bell basis. But over here, we're doing the reverse. We're going from the Bell basis to the computational basis. But you can see there's an even more uh, nuanced part to this because we're not just dealing with two qubits. We are adding this additional third qubit. And then we're performing this measurement over here. So we're, we're measuring both of these qubits. And when we measure them, we're going to get classical bits. We're either going to get zero or one in our computational basis. So then those classical bits are being sent through this classical channel. Now that we have this general overview and this comparison of super dense coding and quantum teleportation, let's have a look at the specific quantum states at stages in these protocols. We will begin by analyzing super dense coding and then we will move on to quantum teleportation. Let's mathematically describe the quantum state at four stages in the super dense coding protocol. First, let's have a look at this stage. This is at the very end of the preparation subroutine. The mathematical notation over here tells us that we first initialize qubit 1 and qubit 0 in the computational basis state 0, 0. Then h sub 1 tells us that we apply the Hadamard gate to qubit 1. This is followed by the application of the controlled NOT gate. And the control qubit is qubit 1. That's denoted by this c sub 1. And the target qubit is qubit 0. That is denoted by x sub 0. This transforms the computational basis state 0, 0 into the Bell basis state, beta zero, zero. So now we have an entangled pair of qubits. These can now be transported to the sender's lab and the receiver's lab. So we're going to distribute these two qubits via single qubit quantum channels. So we have a single qubit quantum channel, which takes qubit one from the preparation lab to the sending lab. And we have another single qubit quantum channel which takes qubit zero from the preparation lab to the receiving lab. Now let's have a look at this stage over here. So we're, we have another purple line and this purple line is slicing through the quantum circuit diagram. So it is giving us a snapshot of the quantum state at this particular stage. So now we have beta zero zero. So these qubits are still in this entangled state, but now they've been acted on by X sub one raised to the power of b0. What is this x sub 1? That is the Pauli x gate, or we can also think of it as a bit flip. And this bit flip is acting on qubit 1. That's because the sender only has access to qubit 1, which uh, the sender received from the preparer's lab via this single qubit quantum channel. So this over here is the symbol for a classically controlled bit flip. And it is being controlled by B0. So B0 is the value of this bit. This is one of the two bits that the sender wants to send over to the receiver's lab. The other bit, which is B1, is being used as this control over here for this controlled phase flip. Or in other words, this is a controlled Z gate applied to qubit 1. 
So that is denoted by this z sub 1, and it is being raised to the power of b1. So what does this power actually mean? If the exponent is equal to 0, that means you don't apply the gate. But if the exponent is equal to 1, it means you do apply the gate. So depending on what these bits are, we will apply a classically controlled bit flip followed by a classically controlled phase flip. And we're going to apply that to the state beta 0, 0. And at this stage over here, this third stage that is shown in this visualization, we're going to get the Bell basis state beta sub B1, B0. So this is one of the four Bell basis states. And we're using B1 and B0, so we have a general notation. We're, we're going to take into account all four options. So there are four possible combinations that the sender could be sending. And they are uh, written over here. So this is the label for this Bell basis state. Now, the sender has to send this qubit through a single qubit quantum channel. And that's going to go from the sender's lab to the receiver's lab. At this stage over here, the receiver has access to both qubit 1 and qubit 0. So qubit 0 has come straight from the preparer's lab, but qubit 1 has had some flips occurring over here. So it might have been bit flipped and phase flipped, depending on the states of these bits over here, B1 and B0. So now the receiver is going to apply this controlled NOT gate followed by this Hadamard gate. So this is the opposite order to what is present up here. That's because we are now going from the Bell basis to the computational basis. It's the opposite. And note that the Hadamard gate and the controlled NOT gate, they are both unitary operators. So if we want to undo their action, we just have to apply them in reverse order. And that is shown in this mathematical representation. So that is just before measurement over here. Before we, we perform measurements on these two qubits, we have access to this quantum state. And if we take a snapshot at that quantum state just before measurement, we're going to have the results of applying all of these gates. And that's going to give us the computational basis state B1, B0. So this computational basis state actually encodes the information about these two classical bits that were in the sender's lab. So now when measurement is performed, we're going to get B1 and B0 in the receiver's lab. So note that this representation over here shows you all the stages of superdense coding. You begin with this initialization. So this, this, period, this part over here is initialization, and then this part is preparation. So that's the beta zero zero state that we had at the end of the preparation subroutine. Then we have this bit flip and this phase flip, which are both classically controlled by the values of these bits in the sender's lab. And that gets us to this stage where we have beta sub B1, B0. And then finally, we go back to the computational basis from the Bell basis. And we do that by applying the controlled NOT gate and the Hadamard gate in reverse order. And note that the Hadamard gate is still being applied to qubit 1, and qubit 1 is still acting as the control qubit, and qubit 0 is acting as the target qubit. So all of this over here gets us to this stage over here, where we have B1 and B0. So the value of these bits, which are the labels for this computational basis state, they are the same bits that are occurring as exponents for this bit flip and this phase flip. So what is the overall procedure in superdense coding? We are sending two classical bits from the sender's lab to the receiver's lab. And how are we doing that? We are actually sending the information about those classical bits through a single qubit quantum channel. So that is why this is very special. We're using entanglement, we're using an entangled pair of qubits in order to facilitate this procedure where we have two classical bits sent via a single qubit. Next, we're going to examine quantum teleportation. We're going to see some similarities. And we're also going to see some differences because we're going to need to introduce an extra qubit. Let's mathematically describe the quantum state at various stages in the quantum teleportation protocol. We're going to see many similarities with the superdense coding protocol. So first, let's have a look at the quantum state 
at the end of the preparation subroutine. This part is exactly the same as the super dense coding protocol. We produce the beta 0, 0 bell state. So this is an entangled state. And then we distribute qubit 1 to the sender's lab and qubit 0 to the receiver's lab. So now that we've distributed these qubits, let's have a look at what is going on in the sender's lab. The sender's lab has an additional qubit. So now we also have Q2. This is the third qubit in uh, this procedure. And we're going to initialize Q2 in the state Psi. So this is a general qubit state. And the goal of this procedure is to teleport this qubit state from the sender's lab to the receiver's lab. That's why this is called quantum teleportation. We're taking the information about this quantum state and we're transporting that over from the, the, from the sender's lab to the receiver's lab. So immediately what we see over here is the reverse of this preparation procedure. We have the controlled knot and then the Hadamard, and this is followed by measurements. So let's examine what's happening at each of these stages. We're going to have a look at snapshots of the quantum state. So at this point over here, we're at the beginning of the sending subroutine. And what we have is a three qubit state. So we have Psi, that's the state of Q2. And then we have beta zero zero. That is an entangled state. And this is a two qubit state that describes the collective quantum state of Q1 and Q0. So this is what we're dealing with at the beginning of the sending subroutine. When we apply the controlled not gate, the control qubit is qubit two, and the target qubit is qubit one. So note that these subscripts are not the same as the subscripts over here. So over here we have one and zero as the subscripts, and over here we have two and one as the subscripts. So this is specifying which qubits are being used as the control and the target in this controlled not gate. So we're acting with the controlled not gate on this three qubit system. And after we have this stage, we're going to act with the Hadamard gate on Q2. So that is denoted by H2. So H2 comes after C2X1. And this is a mathematical representation of these gates being applied to Q2 and Q1. So note that we can't describe uh, what's going on in this lab without reference to Q0. So that's because Q1 and Q0 are in an entangled state. They are in this bell state, beta 0, 0, when they are distributed to the sender's lab and the receiver's lab. So now at this stage, we're going to see some algebraic manipulation, which is going to justify why we get this state over here. So we'll see that later, but let's just take this for granted now and have a look at what happens to this state. So this is a representation of the quantum state at this stage before measurement. So we have this measurement procedure after we apply the Hadamard gate and the controlled not gate. And let's just have a look at what is happening over here. So we have a sum over B0 and B1. These are bits. And we're summing over the values that these bits can have. So these bits can either be 0 or 1. That is what is going on in these sums. Then the state of Q2 and Q1 is summarized by this two qubit state. And what we have are B1 and B0. They are the labels for this two qubit state. But what is going on with the state of Q0? Well, Q0 has got Psi occurring over here. That's the same Psi that we initialized Q2 as. So that's this quantum state. But it is not just Psi. It is Psi getting acted on by a phase flip followed by a bit flip. And this phase flip and bit flip have exponents. And these exponents are B1 and B0. So we're going to analyze the algebra that allows us to go from this step to this step. And we're going to algebraically show why this is equivalent. But now uh, let's just have a look at what happens when we do the measurement. So when we perform this measurement, we're going to measure Q2 and Q1. So that is going to collapse this into one of the four options. 
So we're going to measure B1, B0. That's one, one of these four options over here. Now that means that this Q0 is automatically going to get turned into one of those four options. So B0 and B1 will be specified. Then we will have two classical bits. And we need to send those classical bits from the sender's lab through a two-bit classical channel. And that's going to end up in the receiver's lab. And then the receiver is going to use those classical bits, that's B1 and B0, and the receiver is going to apply classically controlled phase and bit flips. So the bit flip is going to come first, and then the phase flip is going to come over here. So look at this stage right before we go into the gates in the receiving uh, subroutine. We can see that this is identical to this format over here. So we have one of those four options, and those four options are specified by the values of B0 and B1. When we perform the measurement of Q2 and Q1, we get one of those four options. But we don't have Psi. We have not successfully teleported the state of Psi. So what do we have to do? We have to take the information encoded by those two classical bits, and then we have to apply these classically controlled bit and phase flips. So first we apply the bit flip, and that's going to counteract this bit flip over here. So the Pauli X and the Pauli Z gates, they are Hermitian. So they are Hermitian and they are unitary. So that means they are actually their own inverse. And that is why when you apply a bit flip twice, it undoes the original bit flip. So we have these two bit flips, and they cancel each other out, and we're just left with this phase flip over here. And to cancel this phase flip out, we have to apply another phase flip. And it has to have the same exponent. We have to have B1 up here. And that is why we need to send these classical bits. We need to have that same exponent so that we can cancel out this phase flip. So when we cancel out this phase flip, we're just going to be left with Psi. And Psi is a single qubit state. So we can write this in the single qubit computational basis states. So it is a linear combination of the state 0 and the state 1. And the coefficients are alpha sub 0 and alpha sub 1. So now we have this identical state. This is exactly the same state in the receiver's lab that we started with in the sender's lab. So that is why this is called quantum teleportation. We are teleporting the state of Q2, which is in the sender's lab, and we're moving that over to the receiver's lab. And we have to do that by sending two classical bits. So that is how this procedure works. So you can see that this is a little more complicated than the super dense coding procedure. Now, the next stage in this explanation is going to be to perform some algebraic working to justify why this equivalence holds. Because all of this reasoning down here is only present because we have this relationship. And in this format, we can easily see what happens when we measure qubit 2 and qubit 1. Then we're just left with this state for qubit 0. And that allows us to go through these three stages. So let's have a look at the algebra that underlies this uh, relationship over here. Let's justify the quantum teleportation sending subroutine with some algebraic manipulation. First, let's have a look at this top state. We have Psi beta 0, 0. Psi is the state of Q2, and beta 0, 0, that is the collective entangled state of Q1 and Q0. Psi can be written as a superposition of the computational basis states for a single qubit. So we have the state 0 and the state 1. The coefficients in this superposition are alpha sub 0 and alpha sub 1. We can also express beta 0, 0 in full. We can express this in the two qubit computational basis. So we have a superposition of 0, 0 and 1, 1. There is also a normalization coefficient of 2 to the power of minus 1 half. We can also write that as 1 over the square root of 2. Now we can expand these terms out. And that's going to give us this equivalent expression. So we can pull the normalization coefficient out to the front. And then we can see that there are two terms that are multiplied by alpha sub 0 and two terms that are multiplied by alpha sub 1. 
These terms come from multiplying this zero state with zero, zero. So that explains this zero, zero, zero. And then we have zero and then one, one. That explains this zero, one, one. Both of these states are multiplied by alpha sub zero. Next, let's have a look at this state over here. When it gets applied to these states, we have one, zero, zero. That explains this. Then we have one, one, one. That explains this. And we can group them together where the coefficients are at the front. So this is at the beginning of the sending subroutine. Next, we're going to apply the controlled NOT gate. Qubit 2 is acting as the control qubit, and qubit 1 is acting as the target qubit. So we're going to start with this format over here, and then we're going to apply the control NOT gate. You can see the notation over here is C2X1. So we apply this to the initial state that we started with, and what does that do? Well, it doesn't do anything to these states. Here we still have 0, 0, 0 and 0, 1, 1. But it does do something to these two states. You can see that the first qubit over here, the first bit in this uh, sequence, is a 1. And that turns on the controlled NOT gate. So we have 1 over here, and that activates a bit flip in the second place over here. That's Q1. So Q1 is the target. And that turns this 1, 0 into a 1, 1. And this 1, 1 gets turned into a 1, 0. That is the action of the controlled NOT gate on these basis states. And observe that this final qubit over here, Q0, is unchanged. So here we still have a 0, that 0 is unchanged, and this 1 at the end is unchanged. Why is that the case? Well, this controlled NOT gate is not doing anything to Q0. It's only affecting Q2 and Q1. So this is what has happened, and that is a result of uh, this application of the controlled NOT gate. Next, what we can do is pull out a zero state from the beginning of these guys over here. So we, because these are all tensor products, this is just shorthand notation for tensor products of single qubit computational basis states. We can pull out this zero, which is common in both of these terms. So we have a zero over here, and then we have 0, 0 plus 1, 1. And we can do a similar thing over here. We can pull out this 1, which is common. And that's going to give us a 1 out the front. And then we have 1, 0 and 0, 1. And these coefficients are still at the front. We have alpha sub 0 and alpha sub 1. Now, in this format, what we're going to do is apply the Hadamard gate to Q2. So Q2 is the one that's furthest to the left. And you can see why I've pulled out this 0 and this 1 over here. So we can just take these single qubit computational basis states and apply the Hadamard gate to them. So that's going to take us from the Pauli Z eigenbasis to the Pauli X eigenbasis. So this 0 is going to turn into a superposition of 0 and 1 with a normalization coefficient of 2 to the minus 1 half. And this 1 is going to turn into a superposition of 0 minus 1. So there is a relative phase factor over here. And we also have this uh, normalization coefficient. So now what we can do is pull out this normalization coefficient and combine it with this normalization coefficient, and that's going to give us 2 to the minus 1. So that is a normalization coefficient out the front. Next, we can expand these terms out. So here we're going to have 0 times 0, 0. That explains this term. Then we have 0 times 1, 1, that explains this term. Then we have 1, 0, 0. Then we have 1, 1, 1, that explains this. And that's all the terms that are multiplied by alpha sub 0. Now let's move on to these terms, which are multiplied by alpha sub 1. First we have 0, 1, 0. Then we have 0, 0, 1. And then we have the terms with the phase factor of minus 1. So that is minus 1, 1, 0, and minus 1, 0, 1. So that's all of these terms. And another thing that we can notice is that we can rearrange all of these terms, and we can pull out a state of Q2 and Q1 out the front, and then we can just have the Q, Q0 state on the right. So let's have a look at the details over here. Let's consider all of the 
three bit sequences that start with the zero, zero. So I can see one over here, we have zero, zero, zero. And we can also see another one over here, we have zero, zero, one. Let's pull out the zero, zero and move that over to the left. That's this stage over here. Then we're going to have alpha zero times that final zero. And over here, we're going to have alpha one times that final one. So that explains this combination over here. Let's do a similar procedure for all of the three bit sequences that start with zero one. I can see a zero one over here. So we have zero one and it is, uh, it is in front of a one. So that means we're going to have alpha zero times one over here. And then we have zero one zero. So that means we're going to have alpha one times zero over here. Next, let's do the same procedure for all bit strings that start with one zero. So I can see a one zero over here. That's going to give us alpha zero zero. That explains this term. And over here, we have one zero with a one, but there is a minus sign over here. So we're going to have alpha one with a minus sign multiplying the state one. So that explains this state over here. And finally, let's have a look at the bit strings that start with one one. So over here we have one one, and that is going to have a one being multiplied by alpha zero. That explains this term. And finally, we're going to have this term over here. So we have minus one one zero. So that explains this minus alpha one zero. So we have the alpha one being multiplied by the minus sign, and it is uh, giving us this zero here. And in this format, we can see that on the left, we have a two qubit computational basis state. And on the right, we have a single qubit superposition. And this superposition is exactly the state psi that we started with. So this is exactly psi. It is expressed in the computational basis for a single qubit. So over here, we have psi by itself without any bit flips or phase flips. So we can write this as the exponents being zero in both cases over here. So this is the same as the identity operator acting on psi. Then we have this case over here. What is going on in this case? Well, we have a bit flip. So there is no phase flip, but there is a bit flip. We are applying the Pauli X gate over here, and that is swapping the zero and the one. You can see the zero and one are swapped compared to this stage over here. So when we have zero one in this uh, state over here, then that corresponds to a one zero over here. And that actually corresponds to a bit flip being applied to psi. Over here, we have one zero and that corresponds to zero one. And that is the same as a phase flip. So that is Pauli Z. And the Pauli Z gate is introducing a relative phase factor of minus one on this one term over here. And finally, we have the result of a phase flip followed by a bit flip. So the order is important. First, we apply the phase flip, which gives us this state, and then we swap zero and one. So you can see if you, if you take this state and you swap the zero and one, you will get this state over here. So the minus sign is out the front of alpha one, but we no longer have a one over here. We now have a zero where there used to be a one. And because this format is the same for all four terms, we can write this as a sum. And we can sum over the values of these two bits, b0 and b1. Because they are bits, they can only take on two values, 0 and 1. So we have this double sum. And on the left-hand side, we have this two-qubit state of q2 and q1. And over here, we have the state of q0. And you can see that if we measure this two-qubit system over here, we're going to collapse to the state b1, b0. So a measurement of this is going to give us two bits, and those bits are b1 and b0. And then the remaining state of q0, this qubit on the furthest to the right, is going to be psi with these phase flips and bit flips, which depend on the values of these classical bits. So that is why the sender has to send those two bits through the classical channel. That is so that the receiver can correct the state, because the state is not correct uh, in three out of the four cases. Only in one out of the four cases do we have the same state occurring. So that's the case where we have the identity operator. But in the other three cases, we have to apply classically controlled gates 
to correct this state. So this is an algebraic justification as to why quantum teleportation works. We have explored a side-by-side -side visualization of superdense coding and quantum teleportation. We also introduced some useful notation for the Bell basis states. And we mathematically described the quantum states at various stages in the superdense coding and quantum teleportation protocols. We compared these two protocols and we noted on some important similarities. Specifically, we talked about the preparation subroutine. Now, this subroutine is responsible for generating an entangled pair of qubits. It is quantum entanglement which enables some of the amazing results in these protocols. If we implement the superdense coding protocol, it is possible for us to communicate two classical bits of information by sending a single qubit through a quantum channel. Similarly, if we implement the quantum tel teleportation protocol, it is possible to transport a single qubit quantum state from one lab to another. But we have to send two classical bits via a classical channel. So these are some really outstanding results in these protocols, and they are enabled by quantum entanglement. The diagrams used in this video are intended as an educational resource. If you go to the description, you can find out where to download these diagrams. They are available in JPEG, PNG, and PDF format.